Good afternoon and a warm welcome to today's webinar titled Rethinking Remanufacturing Waste to Ways for Sustainable Growth. My name is Legion, and on behalf of the host, RentWise Malaysia, I would like to thank you for being here with us this afternoon. Um, we are here actually today to celebrate the Global Remand Day 2022 with hundreds of other remanufacturers globally who have registered this event with uh, the Remanufacturing Industries Council in celebration of the role that remanufacturing uh, plays to build a sustainable future and a circular economy. It would be great if you could use the handles hashtag Remand Day 2022 to check into our event today um, on your various social media platforms and help spread uh, the celebration. Our host today, RentWise Malaysia, Cinder Amber Head, is Malaysia's first IT equipment manufacturer licensed by the Malaysian Investment Development Authority, MIDA, and certified by uh, the Malaysian Ministry of International Trade and Industry, METI. They're also the winner of Enterprise Asia Area Awards for Circular Economy Leadership category in 2020, as well as the winner of the WITSA Global ICT Excellence Award 2021 in Sustainable Growth Circular Economy category for producing the first carbon neutral PC uh, in Malaysia. Now I shall say no more uh, and let this corporate video fill you in further about our host today. The Earth's population is projected to reach 8.6 billion people by 2030. There is an urgent need to provide enough food, water and energy to power this growing demand in the next decade and beyond. This is simply not going to happen unless we change the way we consume. Today, atmospheric CO2 is at a higher level than at any point in the last 3 million years. Humans are injecting more CO2 into the atmosphere at one of the fastest rates ever. The information and communication technology sector's global share of greenhouse gas emission stood at 4% in 2020 and is projected to rise to 14% in 2040. Production and use of a new laptop and desktop emit about 350 kilograms and 800 kilograms of CO2, respectively. In 2019, only 17% out of 54 million metric tons of e-waste generated was properly recycled. The balance 83% was either dumped into landfills or incinerated. We owe humanity's progress in the past century to technology but it appears our soaring IT-related carbon footprint due to unsustainable consumption is holding us back. Is IT working for us or against us? With this in mind, there's growing realization that using the latest and greatest in IT is never necessary. Using remanufactured computers helps reduce as much as 75% carbon emission. At RentWise, the balanced 25% carbon is offset via our reforestation initiative, thereby allowing us to be recognized as the first carbon neutral computer in Malaysia. As the world gears toward achieving net zero by 2050, decarbonization in all sectors becomes a priority. To make this a reality, we need technology to fight climate change. Today, organizations are not only under increasing threat from business disrupting weather patterns, but also from punitive government policies that limit their business opportunities and growth if decarbonization is not observed. IT is an indispensable tool that plays a central role in running any business today. Therefore, it is only logical that a sound carbon reduction strategy begins with using remanufactured computers. Essentially, using remanufactured computers by RentWise is the first step towards improving an organization's ESG profile. Founded in 2001, RentWise's circular business model has served more than 200 medium to large corporations in Malaysia and Singapore. A pioneer remanufacturer of IT equipment in Malaysia, RentWise has to date reduced over 280 million kilograms of CO2 emission from more than 378,000 used computers repurposed. As an award-winning, accredited, and leading independent lessor for end-to-end -end green IT infrastructure, we take great pride in our strict 16-step remanufacturing process. This process has enabled us to extend the use of a PC by up to three cycles, thereby maintaining product utility at its highest value over an average lifespan of 10 years. As a registered social enterprise and signatory member of the United Nations Global Compact, 
aligned to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 4, 12, 13, and 17. RentWise is especially committed to providing equitable access to digital learning among underprivileged school children. Our Digital Learning Empowerment Program has seen more than 100 schools with over 31,000 students benefiting from donated remanufactured computers in a joint collaborative effort with our project partners, many of whom are also our clients. This is timely, especially in light of the pandemic where remote learning has become the norm. We owe it to our future generation to do better. Green IT represents the power to control and pivot towards a sustainable future and achieve our best. Let us help you become the ground zero for change towards net zero. Together, let's seek to ensure sustainable computing for a sustainable planet. Right, and without further ado, um, I would now like to invite Mr. Lance Bu, Commercial Director of RentWise Malaysia, Sindiran Berhad, um, to deliver his welcome speech. Uh, Mr. Lance? Thank you. Thank you, Lee Jin, for the wonderful introduction. Um, honorable guests, uh, panelists, and my fellow RentWisers, foremost, a uh, very big welcome to all of you to this webinar that's hosted by Red Cross Malaysia in conjunction with the World Reman Day that falls exactly today uh, on the 14th of April, which coincidentally is my daughter's birthday. Yeah. So uh, here, my dear, I'd like to wish you a very sweet 16th birthday, uh, but no, you're not going to get the iPhone 13 as wish. Okay, jokes aside, jokes aside, um, now I'd like to begin uh, by sharing a very interesting report uh, that I was shared recently over climate change effects and impacts, but it wouldn't be alien to any one of us here in Malaysia, right? Uh, especially recalling the recent flood of the century yeah, that uh, caused havoc all over Malaysia. And uh, it has worsened beyond just loss of properties, but lives, yeah, which is truly saddening. And uh, that's not all. You know, the rising heat sweeping across our country has spiked uh, tremendously. And if you're not aware, over the past 20 years, our average temperature has blown up by 6.7 degree. Okay. Now imagine in context, a two degree raise in your body temperature. I'm sure you have already been feeling unwell, uh, lethargic, and probably even bedridden, right? But unfortunately, uh, sorry, but fortunately, uh, the flip side of this pandemic uh, led to a huge drop in global air pollution, as much as 40% in developed countries uh, and economies, especially like Italy, South Korea, China, and so on. And therefore allowing our mother earth a short breathing space. Now then on this note, uh, economists are citing that this may be the key towards creating a low carbon economy. Uh, that results in long-term sustainability of our precious one and only planet. And that's truly amazing, is it? Um, now, cast away the negativity factor, this may truly mark a newborn age for mankind. So think about it. So just to share with you, RentWise had a very humble beginning with merely six staff back in 2001. Uh, and driven by purpose as well as passion, we had now grown to a 80 men strong mid-sized organization. So as a social enterprise and a signatory member to UNGC, United Nations Global Compact, our business activities is centered around creating not just value to our customers, but including social and environment as the pillars of growth. So with that, I earnestly urge all of you to join us on this green side and ensuring that we don't inherit our future generations with e-ways, nor an unlivable world. Okay, thank you for spending your precious time here with us today. And uh, do give yourselves a big pat on the back for taking this effort. All right, thank you. Back to you, Lijin. Thank you very much, Mr. Lance, for that, uh, um, <laughs> the, the welcome address. Um, let me just get the uh, screen back on there. So 
Right, now that we've gotten through the formalities of uh, opening the event, it's my pleasure uh, to begin today's webinar as the moderator. Um, just give me a moment there. And we would like to, um, we have sort of planned a rather interactive session today. So I'd like to invite you to participate as much as possible uh, in our polls, ask questions, um, and also uh, be part of the discussion. So, uh, what we have today is that we will start off with uh, two presentations from our esteemed guest speakers, and then we'll have a moderated discussion uh, so that we can have a bit more, more, more relaxed conversation about today's topic before doing a uh, question and answer with you in the audience. Um, after all, it's a celebration, and no celebration is complete without uh, all of you being part of it. I also uh, hear that Renwise has uh, 25 Justo, Justco coupons up for grabs for those who celebrate full out with us today uh, through the chat, the Q&A and sharings. So uh, make sure you participate and uh, get your name into the lucky draw by uh, dropping a line into the chat, uh, into the Q&As and also uh, being part of our sharing um, so that uh, you can be part of this lucky draw that will be happening after this event. Okay, thank you. So hello everyone, my name is Li Jin Chin. I am the Senior Managing Partner of ACMF Circular uh, Economy and the founding chairperson for our soon-to-be uh, Circular Business Association. Uh, we're currently in the process of registering uh, that in Malaysia. Uh, I'm a fellow of the Smith MacArthur Fellowship in Circular Economy since 2016, while doing my master's at Cranfield University in the UK under Achieving Scholarship. And Cranfield is actually one of six pioneer universities that worked closely with Ella MacArthur Foundation to drive research and development um, in the circular economy. Prior to this, um, I have more than seven years uh, of working experience in development and public policy research, uh, mainly doing projects for the Malaysian government and multilateral organizations such as the Economic Planning Unit of Malaysia and also the United Nations uh, Development Program. So ACMF Circular Economy, which is the organization I'm uh, representing, um, what we do is that uh, we provide circular economy business transformation certification consulting services um, and also support companies to identify and monetize circular economy revenue. Um, we work with clients who need circular economy solutions um, by helping first understand their pains, uh, architect the solutions, and then bring different people together to help deliver those solutions. So while we are not the domain expert, uh, we support our clients to ensure that they can transition profitably to the circular economy, uh, making sure that their mandate is sustainable, scalable, and uh, circular economy um, compliant in terms of the, the recent, so most updated trends. Um, ACMS Circular Economy is a business unit under a boutique consulting firm called ACMF Advisory Senior and Berhad, um, which has actually core strengths in private fundraising readiness. Apart from that, um, I, I'm also representing a Circular Business Association. Um, ACMF Circular Economy is leading the founding of this association with the aim of building the strongest SME business ecosystem layer to help accelerate the transition into circular economy and solve the climate crisis. Um, we believe that no organization or entity can get there alone, um, but I'll definitely come back uh, about this business association later on today um, it's so that you can have a bit of a sneak peek. But let's get on with uh, today's celebration, which is um, the, this webinar titled Rethinking Remanufacturing, Ways, Waste to Ways for Sustainable Growth. Now, I would really like to approach today's discussion by first drawing your attention to actually the back of the title, Sustainable Growth, um, before we move on uh, further about remanufacturing in part because it is important to know what it is all uh, for, all this effort, what is it all for before we talk about how to get there. And um, yes, I will be sharing some images that may make you think, come on, this is a celebration. Uh, well, you see, we humans tend to uh, respond more to pain and but my purpose here is not actually to get you down and depressed, but really rejoice in the fact that not all hope is lost. So um, I'm sure a lot of you may have remembered uh, these um, floods that happened 
earlier uh, this year, in fact, just last month. But it's not only in Malaysia. We see also a lot of va uh, various uh, weather events happening across the globe. Uh, for example, this one in Canada actually cut off Vancouver from its major ports for uh, a, a, a few good weeks. And there were major blazes and forest fires as well. Um, these images are just what happened in past year alone. But if we uh, try to uh, look into the International Panel of Climate Change Report, uh, the most recent one, it actually says that we have only up to the end of this decade, which is um, only what, like seven, seven, eight years away from now, um, before this is going to be like common sight. Yeah, um, 1.5 degrees Celsius may be out of the window. And if you thought millions migrating from Ukraine conflict is difficult to cope with, try imagining uh, billion, 3 billion people, 3 billion people migrating because the place that they stay is no longer habitable. So um, it's really a code red um, for humanity uh, in terms of cutting out emissions. And we have to cut about 45% of our entire world's emissions um, in the next few years before the end of this decade. Um, but contrary to the hyper-focus on electrification and renewable energy, the energy sector alone um, is not going to be able to uh, solve the climate crisis. Uh, this is because about 45% of those emissions are embedded in how we make and use products. Um, and these emissions are much more difficult uh, to try and deal with and over, often overlooked. In fact, if we look into all material handling, in, including what's used by the energy sector as well, 70% of greenhouse gas emissions that's driving climate change um, are from material handling and use. And to some extent, this is very much in terms of how we make uh, and use products. Mm, this is what we call the linear economy. Uh, where it's a one-way track of taking what we need, making the products, and then when it's no longer needed or wanted, we throw away those products. Um, uh, so there's no plans of active uh, reuse or recovery or even the regeneration of those ecosystems. And the circular economy therefore really comes in as an alternative to say that what if all of this could be redesigned? Um, what if by design, the economy could actually restore and regenerate all those resources, including humans who are very much part of this ecosystem um, to, to be a better uh, economic model? And the three principles that circular economy um, tends to subscribe to um, includes uh, regenerating of natural systems. What if every time we tapao or took away food in a plastic packaging actually made the soil better and our food healthier. Hmm. What about designing? Uh, the second principle is about designing out waste and pollution. So if there are things that we can't handle, um, then uh, maybe we shouldn't even have it in the design of the products in the first place. Um, and last but not least, uh, to keep products and materials in use, which is very much where uh, we see um, uh, activities such as remanufacturing really help to increase uh, the chances of these products staying in use. But of course, this is a very quick overview um, just, just to start the topic. Um, and now we've seen all the things that we don't want, okay, uh, which is pretty bad from the climate crisis. But the next question is, what is it that we do want? Um, and let's come back, therefore, to the title, Sustainable Growth. Um, and I'm very, very pleased to have with me Ms. Shanta Helena uh, Dorkasin to help enlighten us further on this. Um, Ms. Shanta is the Director of Programs at United Nations Global Compact Network, uh, Malaysia and Brunei. She is also um, the uh, uh, director at Shaping Asia Media, Sundar and Burhad, and has managed custom uh, business content for The Economist and Time magazine based out of Spain, Kenya, and Indonesia. She co-founded the platform of ASEAN uh, Business Leaders, which features interviews and other ASEAN business content. Um, Ms. Shanta is also an MBA graduate from Nottingham University in Malaysia and obtained her BA degree in communications and media studies uh, from the University of Utrecht, uh, Netherlands. So a warm welcome to you, Ms. Shanta. Thank you uh, for joining us today. Great, thank you so much, Lee Jin, uh, for the introduction. And also a big thanks to Renvice for organizing this very important session. 
So it's a pleasure being here. And I think today we are celebrating two special days. Of course, first of all, the Reven Day. And second of all, Mr. Lenz, congratulations to your daughter as well. Sweet 16 is a, a beautiful day to be celebrating. Um, so what I'll do, let me just and, um, start off with a quick presentation. Um, Lijim, maybe you can enable my screen sharing, please. Yep, I think you'll be able to share. Um, Ms. Shanta, maybe before you sort of jump into your presentation, maybe I can just get a quick uh, um, feedback from you in terms of what, what is sustainable growth and how is remanufacturing actually related to this? Yeah, so, um, sorry, Legion, I cannot share my screen. You have to stop sharing first. Oh, right, sorry. Um, yeah, you can do so now, sorry. <laughs> okay, great, got it. All right, so and, um, I think what I'll do um, in, answer, in order to answer to your question, um, remanufacturing is um, a specific area that is following on the sustainability and ESG. Um, as we are working towards achieving those SDGs and achieving a sustainable world for all. Um, so a bit about myself before I'm going to deep dive into the topics I set forth today. And um, as mentioned, I am from the UN Global Compact Network, Malaysia and Brunei. So this is a global organization. It's a members-based organization in which we are working together, mainly with the private sector, but also with other stakeholders, understanding how we can advance sustainability in the businesses, through businesses. So we have a global representation of about 69 local networks. So here we are representing Malaysia and Brunei. And with those, we are approaching the SDGs and sustainability through our four key principles. So the four key principles that in the UNGC that we adopt are anti-corruption, human rights, labor, and environment, which were actually preceding the SDGs. However, even with all the SDGs principles, uh, we, they are all interrelated and interconnected. Um, so, but we feel that these are the areas in which businesses can make the most advance and impact into achieving those SDGs. So what we are doing is to run different type of programs in order to achieve those, uh, which can take part in um, acceleration programs, which is focused on implementation and building knowledge, as well as we are doing research and insights. And we are also in collaboration with some of our partners developing some tech tools so that also businesses can apply uh, some of those knowledge and, for example, using a uh, carbon calculator to understand what is their carbon footprint and how can we reduce those. So um, coming back again to your question, you know, how is remanufacturing important? So what I'll do is to give a bit of context on sustainability um, as this is flowing forward from this. So the SDGs are the global sustainability footprints. Um, I think most of you will be familiar, especially with the colorful uh, boxes that you may see now everywhere because it's very urgent um, and a lot of work still needs to be done if we want to achieve this SDGs by 2030. So it has been made in um, consultation with all of the UN, UN nations, um, both with policymakers, but also understanding from the think tanks and the academic sector and also the private sector about what all needs to be done and how can we achieve those goals set for together. So it is all based on these main principles, which is leaving nobody behind, gender equality, uh, social, social parts of it, inclusivity, environmental sustainability, and governance and ethics. So these are some of the cornerstones that further on the SDGs have been built upon. So within every nation, these are factors that people can relate to. So a lot of improvements have been already occurred in the past decade. For example, there's been improved access to water, uh, which is improving also health and sanitation. Um, the big uh, improvements also in averting HIV, so improvement in health and kids that are being enrolled into primary education. However, having said that, during the pandemic, there's been quite a bit of a setback. Unfortunately, um, many of those achievements and of those progress have been set back. So this is even more important now about how are we going to reset the economy after coming back from the pandemic? And what are some of the sustainable changes that we should make into our daily lives? 
So just a bit of a snapshot on how the Asia Pacific is in its uh, achievement of the SDGs. As you can see, we're still quite far behind for the latest date and by 2021. Um, especially, and very sad to say, on climate action, we are lagging severely behind. Um, even though we have may have saved a lot of carbon outprint during the pandemic because we were unable to fly in imports and exports were slowed down. However, now that we are getting back on track, there is still a lot of unresponsible uh, production and consumption, which is also contributing to a negative growth for the climate action in achieving the climate action growth goals. So another global risk assessment, which is annually done by the WEF Forum, you know, maybe when we are think about global risk, we tend to just think about the economy. And because it is just our tendency to put everything into financial numbers. And that's why sometimes sustainability has a bit overlooked because we cannot directly put uh, num num numbers to it. However, as we are advancing, we are now actually coming up with different sets of programs and measurements that we can contribute economic value to it. So according to the WEF, as you can see from this uh, risk landscape, most of the risks are actually related to ESG, to environmental, social, and governance. So having said this, sustainability is becoming more important, not only for businesses and policymakers, but also as individuals, and what are the consumer choices that we are deciding to make. So for climate risk, and this has been like quite a priority and becoming also in the Malaysian national and, um, focus. So the physical risk and the transition risk um, that you know, some of you may be familiar with as we experienced the flooding, which was really, really terrible, but also on the contrary, more drought, uh, sea level rises, heat stresses. So all of these extreme weather conditions are an effect of climate change. So the potential financial impacts will also be greatly affected. I mean, just look at Malaysia and how the country is so much coastline, has so much coastline. So you imagine all of the small villages or the kampungs that have very high risk uh, to flooding. So all of these communities and businesses that are being settled there are so going to suffer greatly, uh, financially impacted greatly from climate change. So as Mr. Lenz previously mentioned, and um, there has been average temperature rises of 6.7 degrees. And um, so this is, for example, in JB. Um, where we have collected the data. So you can see that there has been so much of a temperature increase, and this is mainly due to larger urbanization. So even though now we all like to live in, you know, very lively and urban areas, but it also has its negative effects because all of the infrastructure and all of the cement that is being built is trapping heat. And it's very hard in order for, you know, climate change and climate impact not to be affected by this. So whenever we're looking at infrastructure, it's very important. And this is what we do in UNGC as well, to involve those stakeholders and property developers, for example, to see how can they build more greener infrastructures. And this is a multi-stakeholder approach that everybody should be looking into. Um, similar data for IPO, where there's also been uh, 6.7 uh, temperature degrees, which is 245%. So if we are really getting all of this data and putting the numbers behind it, we realize how severe this crisis has been already. So the once in a hundred years flood effect, which was happening previously, now that we can see that these floods are happening more often, more increasing, and only every time, the, all of the damages that will be done will increase. So it should be a very clear wake up call that we all need to take a very strong stance and contribute our part in taking climate action. So sustainability, whereas, you know, we may tend to say like, oh, we need to help our future generations. We cannot do this to our future generation. However, it's actually happening already in our generation. So it's no longer an issue that we can push forward. Um, so the urgency is really now. And it's really great to see that a lot of youth movements are especially coming into play, led by Greta Thunberg, uh, which is an example for all of us to show what actually has to be done and that we can no longer just talk about taking climate action, but we should actually do something about it. So how sustainability is important for businesses directly is 
coming from many different dimensions. First of all, there's a consumer pressure. So especially the younger consum consumers, millennials, and especially Gen Z are very eager to make sustainable purchasing decisions. So what this means is that they're sometimes, and most of the time, willing to pay a higher price, a price premium, um, but also for global supply chains or even domestic supply chains, corporates are looking into how can they green their supply chain. So whether this means to purchase, you know, your IT equipment that is being remanufactured because it helps you to lessen your carbon footprint, but also other type of suppliers and products are becoming more subject and under scrutiny in order to lower their carbon footprint. But in addition to this kind of pressures, we also have financing and uh, regulations and the legislative, legislative framework that are slowly starting to tighten this type of regulations. So for example, for those businesses that are not taking climate action into consideration, they may risk paying a higher price on their loans and getting more difficulty in order to access finance. So if you want to apply as a business owner, if you're going to apply for a loan at your local bank, they may ask you, what are you doing in order to mitigate climate risk? Are you taking any climate action? And if your answer is yes to those previous questions, you could very mostly likely get financial incentives uh, that are provided to sustainable businesses that are making such transitions. So from a regulatory landscape, and um, the needle's also moving more forward. So we can see that at the moment, there's a national voluntarily carbon market. However, at one point, this will be an, um, moving more towards compliance, especially since Malaysia has also in mind to incorporate a carbon tax. So this will have direct financial consequences for your business. So sustainable value chains are um, becoming more important as mentioned. So sustainability products represent more than 50% of the overall consumer markets uh, goods. So looking into this, there's a large opportunity to tap into because we tend to just look at sustainability and ESG from a risk perspective. However, if we're able to really capture all of those trends and make a very strong proposition out of it, such as Rentwise is doing for its remanufacturing, then it is able to really grow your business and to make a strong value proposition. So as uh, just to summarize why sustainability is important, it's coming both from the consumer, from the financer and from the regulator perspective. However, when we're talking about sustainability, we do need to back this up with ESG data. So ESG data, especially from a financing perspective, they'll be looking more into what is all of the sustainability claims that are being made and are you able to actually prove and substitute your claims. So sustainability and um, CSR are sometimes still a bit used interchangeably. However, there's a very large difference into it, meaning that sustainability is more of a strategic approach and how you can make your business value proposition. Whereas CSR tends to be more of a philanthropic way and just giving out where it doesn't really is incorporated within your business. So that's why in the UN Global Compact, we strongly encourage uh, businesses to pursue their sustainability because in that way, they can also benefit from it and not just look at it as an investment. So a bit of deep dive into the ESG principles, which is standing for environmental, social and governance. And um, so sometimes, and this is my personal experience when I st first started working in sustainability, you hear a lot of acronyms and sometimes it can be very overwhelming. What are all of this meaning? So just to be clear, like the difference between sustainability and ESG is that ESG is capturing those data points. Sustainability is a more holistic approach that we can have as a consumer or as a business owner or as a policymaker to advance sustainability as a whole. But the direct impacts that it has on the environment, social and governance dimensions, and these are some of the points that can be measured. So for example, when we're looking at climate change and at your carbon footprint, these are things that we can measure. Also for social, even though they are more of a qualitative data approach, however, we can measure, for example, how many women do you have in your management functions? Or what is the wages that are being paid to the employees? Are, is this the minimum wage or is it a living wage? Because there's a difference in that too. So for governance, for example, includes like anti-corruption procedures. All of these are very important in order to make sustainability sustainable. 
So the ESG opportunities and um, by solving these kind of sustainability challenges and issues can actually open up about 1 trillion US dollars to the economy. So there's a lot of new investments and um, that are moving into these kind of sectors. So there's a large opportunity for businesses to capture. So just as a wrap up, so sustainability data also helps you to set sustainability targets um, in order to drive performance. And this can also be reported against the SDGs. I think especially in a time now when sustainability is such a buzzword, we have to be very careful with greenwashing. So some of you may be aware, like greenwashing is when companies are making, especially corporates, where they're making certain sustainability claims, but they're not able to back it up with the proper data or having the right ethics in place. So having this kind of you know, in-depth sessions and insights that is really making companies and um, businesses accountable. So as a wider stakeholder approach, we're always trying to see how can we actually help and demand this data and how can we all contribute to reporting against the SDGs so that we may achieve them by 2030. So this has been my um, presentation. There's my email address. So please do feel count free to contact me if you have any further questions. Um, but I'll stop right there so that we'll have enough time for the further discussions. Thank you, Lejin. Thank you very much, Mishanta, for the very enlightening uh, presentation shared there about also the sustainable development goals, as well as the differences between ESG sustainability, CSR. Um, I, I think at this point, I, I just wanted to share briefly with uh, others uh, this news that, um, in fact, was actually shared by um, my friend about, uh, please give me a moment. The um, possible um, losses as, as very much what Ms. Shanta was sharing just now, um, you know, the possible losses that you may actually see uh, starting to uh, become realized in the uh, coming days, uh, oh, not days, <laughs> coming years, uh, but it's actually not as far as we think it is. Um, this was actually a press release uh, by a Standard Chartered Bank, which actually estimated that Malaysian-based suppliers are actually risking more than uh, 65 billion US dollars in exports um, if uh, they don't deal with this issue of carbon emissions um, and having net zero plans. Um, of course, it's not just about, you know, uh, companies not getting money. Um, um, I think uh, very much what Ms. Shanta also was able to bring out is that there is also the very human aspect to it um, and how businesses have a role to actually play to try and solve uh, the problems that we face today. Um, just to give you an example, a lot of services that we uh, require from products such as uh, sachets like uh, ketchup or shampoo sachets, you know, on the go, we, it gives us a lot of convenience and things like that. But when you start seeing how, um, you know, products like these, this despite the uh, convenience uh, given to us is actually really much choking, um, choking our environment and eventually actually getting into our own health. You know, well, when I saw this piece of news that microplastics had been detected for the first time in human blood, that, that, that really hits home. Um, and in terms of e-waste in particular, I think uh, this, this call, uh, call from the World Health Organization to really deal with uh, electronic waste um, that's creating a lot of health-related problems, um, uh, you would say that disproportionately so in developing countries, uh, is also a very strong uh, indicator that, you know, this is more than just uh, business. It is more than just government. It's actually something very much on a day to day, and it's going to be affect. It's, it's already affecting us um, uh, now. So, thanks very much, Ms. Shanta, for that. Um, I'd like to now sort of uh, move into uh, our next speaker. Uh, but before I introduce the next speaker, I thought it'd be interesting to sort of share some of these uh, statistics, which I happened to come across uh, in this uh, study called Remanufacturing in Malaysia. Oops, sorry for the typo there. Um, the data is a little bit dated is since 2015. But what you can see here is that presently, the remanufacturing uh, sector in Malaysia uh, is contributing about 4 billion a year to the Malaysian uh, economy. Um, and just now when I was watch, looking at Ms. Shanta's slides where, you know, the flood itself wiped out quite a bit of those gains, I was thinking to myself, wow, that's, that's a lot and a lot of uh, value being lost to extreme weather events. But in any case, um, 
as uh, it was estimated that if manufacturing matures in Malaysia, uh, there's an estimated potential that it would more than double to about eight billion a year. Um, and not only uh, in terms of economic value, um, there would be significant environmental benefits that would be coming from uh, uh, remanufacturing activities. Um, so uh, some of the estimates have shown that it could divert uh, 37,000 tons of waste from being disposed. Um, if you think of it not as waste, but actually material that could potentially be used again in the economy, that's, that's a lot of material. Um, and also to avoid about 62,000 tons of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent every year. Um, and also this, this study was just based on four sectors, uh, automobiles, printer cartridges, ICT and aerospace, which is um, so com more commonly found in Malaysia. Uh, of course, if we look at the Remanufacturing Industries Council, who, uh, whose celebration is today, um, they actually mentioned that there are 12 different sectors uh, where remanufacturing industry, uh, remanufacturing activities uh, can be conducted. So there's still a lot more potential out there for us to, 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 to do in remanufacturing. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to highlight to all of you in the audience today that in the 12th Malaysia plan, which is our national development plan, which is what the government has sort of set out to say, this is what we're going to do, and therefore budgets will be flowing accordingly. Um, you can see that remanufacturing has, uh, sort of in a way, gained more prominence this round, uh, especially under thematic area number one, resetting the economy. Um, they've uh, there is plans for a uh, national remanufacturing policy to be uh, launched, and uh, there are five uh, key sector areas uh, where remanufacturing industry uh, is, is likely to uh, be focused on. So before we delve further uh, into the discussion of rethinking remanufacturing today, um, there's quite a few, uh, I, I'd like to like quickly run this uh, poll question um, and, and see what uh, you all um, think. Okay, maybe you can participate and complete uh, the poll question. Let's give you all a few minutes to do that. Okay, last call. Uh, let's do a bit of a countdown there. Five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, I'm ending the poll. And let's have a look at the results together. So, okay, so the most of us actually know a bit about remanufacturing, but we do have some of us um, who know nothing at all from, about remanufacturing. And we do have a, a bit of a group here who is very familiar with it. Uh, it'll be interesting to hear your sharing and things um, later on in the event today. Um, and yes, uh, to the 41% of you who answered correctly, you have been paying attention to our sharing so far. Uh, if 45% of emissions are embedded in products that we make and use every day, um, of course, if we consider all material handling, uh, then 70% um, is in uh, uh, the material handling itself. Yeah. So thank you for uh, doing that activity with us. And hopefully that will um, help you get into our lucky draw as well. Okay, so with that, um, I think it's a great time now to introduce our next speaker because um, Dr. Medley Andrew Munot uh, is here to enlighten us further about um, remanufacturing. Uh, Dr. Madeline is a senior lecturer at Department of Mechanical and Manufacturing in Engineering uh, at the Faculty of Engineering, uh, University Malaysia Sarawak. UNIMAS. She obtained her research doctorate from the University of Monash, Australia, with a specialization in simulation modeling and analysis for remanufacturing. Her research interests are in the area of manufacturing, simulation modeling, and analysis uh, and remanufacturing. She's interested to supervise undergraduate and postgraduates in these research areas. She has also taught numerous courses that include dynamics, uh, thermodynamics, manufacturing systems, simulation modeling, and remanufacturing. Um, welcome, Dr. Medlin. Can I invite you to please turn on your video? So while we uh, await uh, Dr. Madeline to uh, turn on her, uh, yeah, okay. So 
Hello, Dr. Medlin. Hello, Li Jin. How are you? <laughs> Welcome. Um, I guess, like, just looking at the poll question, there's some of us here who have no idea about remanufacturing and some of us who do know a bit of it. Um, so maybe I'll just start off uh, with a question to you um, as you get your slides ready. What qualifies as remanufacturing? And really, what's the difference between remanufacturing, repair, refurbishment, or even recycling? Well, in simple term, remanufacturing is taking malfunction or used products and restoring them into as good as new product. If you want to know more about the difference between these recovery options, then please allow me to proceed with my presentation. Sure, let's go ahead. Hello, good afternoon to everyone. So thank you to Li Jin for the introduction. First of all, I would like to thank Randwise and Rian Berhad for inviting me to join their Remand Day 2022 by sharing my knowledge on remanufacturing. My sharing will be on general concept of remanufacturing from the academic perspective. So for today's presentation, I will be recovering remanufacturing in general. In the conventional linear economy, raw materials are harvested, refined, and used to manufacture products, which are then sold and used until the product reach their end of life or malfunction. Then this end of life or malfunction products or otherwise be known as waste, if they are not properly disposed, would normally be sent to landfill or incinerated. Over time, sending this waste to landfill or incineration harms the environment. Electric and electronic waste, or otherwise known as e-waste, are generated either from industrial or household waste. According to the statistics provided by the Department of Environment, the amount of e-waste in Malaysia is projected to increase by 17% from the year 2022 to 2025. The recently emerging circular economy, which is represented in figure two here, puts emphasis on minimizing resource input and waste, emission and energy leakages by keeping the added value in products for as long as possible. So to achieve these strategies that are beyond simple reuse and material recycling are important in order to preserve the value of the product function. Therefore, as we can see in this figure two, Remanufacturing brings used product back to the producer or the manufacturer, and this is important to achieve circular economy. So what is remanufacturing? It is actually defined as a standardized industrial process that takes place within industrial or factory settings in which the used products, or also known as cores, they are restored to original as new condition and performance or better. This process is in line with specific technical specifications, including engineering, quality, and testing standards, and typically yields fully warranted products. As we can see in this figure, there are several processes which are very important for remanufacturing of a used product. Here we can see a bigger picture how remanufacturing is related to the circular economy. As we can see here, cores or used products, they are collected from the original user and they are sent for remanufacturing. After completing the remanufacturing process and also pass the testing process, these remanufactured products are then sold to the new customers or even to the original 
users. So in this case, we can see that the loop is closed whereby waste to the landfill or incineration is minimized. Here in table one, just now Ali Jin was asking me, what is the difference between remanufacturing and other type of recovery techniques? Okay, so here in table one, we can compare remanufacturing with other recovery option in terms of the disassembly process, in terms of the quantity of the components that are recovered, in terms of the quality of the restored component, is it possible to include technological upgrade? And how long is the service life? Is warranty provided or is the embodied value retained? Sometimes remanufacturing is confused with refurbish. Okay, so as we can see from this figure one, refurbishing is different from remanufacturing with respect okay, to the disassembly process, the quantity of the component that is recovered, and also the quality of the refurbished component, and lastly, the length of the service life. In addition, in terms of process, refurbishing is not as comprehensive as remanufacturing, and refurbishing is usually carried out within a repair or a maintenance facilities, whereas remanufacturing must be carried out in a factory or industrial setting. So if we compare remanufacturing with all of these techniques, we can see that for remanufacturing, the quantity, the quantity of the recovered component is very high. The quality of the remanufactured component is also very high. And it is possible to upgrade the remanufactured product. It has high service life, which comes with warranty. And of course, the embodied value is retained. Therefore, remanufacturing is an effective closed loop measure to achieve circular economy as it presents great potential for economic, environment, and social benefits. Just now, Ms. Lee Jin also shared some of the sectors that are involved in remanufacturing. Okay, so these are divided into 12 major sectors, as we can see, which involves aerospace, automotive, consumer products, electrical apparatus, heavy duty equipment, information technology, locomotive systems, machinery, medical equipment, office furniture, restaurants, equipments, and tires. Let us be real. Remanufacturing involves a lot of opportunities. So for companies that are interested to engage in remanufacturing business, the opportunities are in terms of economics, cost savings, reduced lead time, alternative business models, as well as reduced risk of insecurity. Therefore, if Therefore, realizing and leveraging on these opportunities could help remanufacturing business to remain competitive. However, on the other hand, remanufacturing also involves some challenges. Okay, so among others, these challenges are raw materials or used products collection, technology and method, product design skill, manpower, and expert needed, marketing and competition, as well as environment and government policy. It is very important for remanufacturing business to be aware of these challenges and therefore take necessary actions so that they can have efficient remanufacturing business. As for research, until now, there have been numerous research related to remanufacturing. These are related to the remanufacturing process itself, 
as well as to the solution of the problems. The recently emerging Industry 4.0 and its tools is also applicable to remanufacturing practice. Therefore, further research can be directed to investigate the application of Industry 4.0 tools such as Internet of Things, Big Data Analysis, Predictive Maintenance, Assessment of EOL products, Augmented Reality or Virtual Reality to the field of remanufacturing. Also, future research can look into uncertainty studies national and international policies, as well as design for remanufacturing. Last but not least, in the Faculty of Engineering Unimas, our research mainly focus on the development of simulation model for remanufacturing, which is then implemented to analyze critical factors affecting the remanufacturing process. Since 2008 until today, there have been numerous uh, publications in terms of conferences, exhibitions, and journal articles that have been published. We have come to the end of my setting session. So thank you for your attention and time. And once again, I would like to thank Randwise Sunan Berhad for giving me this opportunity to share my academic knowledge on remanufacturing so that the audience can have a full awareness of what is remanufacturing and how it is related to sustainability. That's all, Lijin. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Madeline, for that uh, presentation and for enlightening us about the differences between uh, all these re-re-re terms, which can be quite confusing. Um, so with that, I'd like to like quickly launch a, a next poll before we get into our next session. Um, this poll is uh, just for fun, and then we'll see whether or not... Um, uh, you know, you have a chance to join the lucky draw. And of course, I would like to say that uh, it, it would ideally be if you, you could manage to get the poll answers correct, yeah? So anyway, have a go with this trivia. So, um, right, so that we still have a few people who do think that uh, repair is the same as remanufacturing. Um, and also a few who uh, think that uh, remanufacturing is not about keeping products in use for longer. Um, so I think that's probably something if you'd like to clarify further with uh, Dr. Madeline or ourselves later on um, in the Q&A session, that would be great. Um, but yeah, it's definitely that uh, remanufacturing can help reduce emissions and virgin material needs by actually helping to increase the life cycles of products. Um, yeah, although not eliminating it completely, of course, uh, which makes sense. Anyway, thanks for uh, being part of that small trivia question. Um, we have now gotten to our next uh, sort of uh, section of today's webinar. Um, and this is our moderated discussion. So I would really like to invite back our um, two uh, panelists, um, Ms. Shanta and also Dr. Madeline uh, to the screen, as well as invite um, Mr. Lenz from Rentwise to join in the fun um, and uh, bring the industry perspective to this discussion. Um, so I see I'll have started to add. Okay, so I will stop share so we can see each other. E yeah, okay. So I hope that you can see us now. Right. So uh, thank you very much for being part of the moderated discussion. I thought of this session as just being rather relaxed. So I hope you can relax, panelists. A nice smile would be good. <laughs> Uh, but in any case, uh, let's kick it off with uh, Dr. Madeline, since, since you were the last presenter. Um, I know that you were involved with a number of engineering related things, uh, but what actually got you interested in remanufacturing in the first place? I mean, uh, why would people be even interested in remanufacturing? Um, there's so many parts to engineering. 
Well, let me begin my story. It all started in 2005, where I was surveying for potential supervisor for my doctorate research. Back then in 2005, I emailed a few academicians from various Australian universities, asking them their area of research on manufacturing. Fortunately, I received a few replies, and one of them is from Associate Professor Dr. Ralph Abraham from Monash University, and he explains that his current research area is on remanufacturing, which was a hot topic back then in Europe in the year 2000s. And he also believed that this will be a hot topic in Malaysia in a few years to come. At that time in 2005, I do not know anything about remanufacturing. So I decided that I want to challenge myself and I decided to pursue my PhD research on remanufacturing, mm. whereby I applied simulation technique to study the remanufacturing process and what are the critical factors that affect this remanufacturing process. So that is how I ended up being a person who is doing research on remanufacturing. Mm, I see. So one thing, one thing led on to the other. And uh, as we, as your supervisor correctly predicted, remanufacturing is definitely heating up back now uh, in Malaysia as well. Yes. Right. Okay. So um, I guess the next, next thing I wanted to like uh, ask is actually, or, or maybe it's more of a curious question that Dr. Medley actually did raise as well. Um, perhaps like Lance, Mr. Lance, you can uh, share how, how do manufacturing, remanufacturing of a laptop actually happen? You know, what's behind the scenes and what are so, a sort of costs that's incurred? Um, maybe Mr. Lance, you'd like to chip in on that. Yeah, sure. In fact, um, as clearly what the, uh... Dr. Madeli has uh, presented, there's a clear distinction between refurbish and remanufacturing. And of course, for guys, especially, you know, who, or even ladies who's, um, who's well-versed in cars, uh, we all know how to differentiate between a reconditioned car against a used car, right? So that is a simple analogy, yeah? But uh, tying back to um, ICT, or in this particular case, like the computers, what clearly distinguish us uh, compared to a refurbisher is the extensiveness of uh, work that is applied uh, during the remanufacturing process. And all in all, there are 16 steps of them. Um, yeah, thanks, Regent. So here you go. And uh, all these steps are governed by uh, stringent uh, quality checks as well as its uh, sub-processes. Yeah, so for example, the disassembly is no means easy at all. Yeah, so it takes days, if not even many hours, to ensure that those parts are all, you know, disassembled into bits and pieces mm -hmm. so that we could identify exactly what should we repair or if not, then replace. So all of this extensiveness is rigorous, it's definitely rigorous. And therefore, it takes for us uh, to remanufacture an equipment easily up to seven days. Yeah, so so it's a... It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a skill set based kind of uh, industry for us to have. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. where we can collectively also build up a knowledge based society via remanufacturing, because these kind of jobs are um, not uh, in a way replaceable by humanoid or robots, you know. Uh, and therefore, it, it is that kind of uh, impact that we can also deliver beyond just commercial benefits. So, coming back to this, uh, our work. So the, uh, our process here, the 16 steps, have been certified or, or actually been certified by a body that is commissioned by MICHI, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, by using the 3GM or G3M methodology, uh, notably, that is also adopted by Toyota. So Toyota actually adopts this G3M methodology as well in terms of their lean manufacturing. And uh, with that, uh, it has been uh, an honor that uh, we were selected and therefore we were accredited eventually and uh, we even achieved high distinction. So if you notice, it's scoring almost 100% in most areas. So yeah, that is a snippet of um, exactly what we do 
uh, when it comes to remanufacturing. Right. Oh, sorry, I forgot to slash, slash one more slide there that you uh, oh. would have liked to share. Yeah. Okay. This is um, yeah. This is actually beyond remanufacturing. Uh, well, it is um, sitting out of the process, but it ties back to you know the eventual impact of what remanufacturing uh, could provide or could lead to, which is um, uh, lowering, if not even uh, decarbonizing, uh, decarbonizing the entire product itself. And of course, there's nothing rocket science. So long as we're able to derive what is the carbon footprint of our product, then we could apply the necessary offsetting measure. So in this case here, we have adopted the reforestation as a key uh, offsetting measure and program, and uh, therefore earning us to be recognized globally um, during the uh, WITSA uh, award, as well as um, the local Malaysian book of records for being the first carbon neutral PC. Right, thank you very much for that. Um, and also, I think there was a question in the Q&A session, uh, in the Q&A tab, which I think uh, Mr. Lance has also provided uh, um, the answer for, which is that uh, RentWise actually ethically disposes via DOE certified recyclers um, when those uh, e-waste finally reaches its end of its life cycles after many more cycles now uh, because of what RentWise is doing in the remanufacturing scene. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's how we uh, deal with e-waste in a much better way. Yeah. So um, with that, I guess I want to now direct uh, the uh, the question a little bit to to find out, like, uh, because when you mentioned, um, you know, METI trying to accreditate you, I think the the question that uh, emerges in our mind would be like, why would why would METI actually be involved? METI is like international trade uh, and industry. Um, Mr. Lance, do you think you could like enlighten us on that? Good question. Uh, in fact, uh, MITI is the custodian of uh, the remanufacturing economy in Malaysia. Yeah, uh, not any other ministries, but uh, MITI itself. And uh, with that, they had also identified the uh, four key industries or sectors to uh, begin such a uh, roadmap, and uh, ICT being one of it. Yeah. So therefore, um, it was just timely. It was just timely and uh, for the effort that uh, we have prepared ourselves over the years. So it was timely that uh, they discovered us. Yeah. In fact, um, uh, beyond just MIT, or probably that was an outcome of the APEC US aid report uh, that was funded by APEC organization that we were also one of the selected uh, reviewing uh, um, companies or entity, yeah, which basically they just did two. So we were one of them. So probably one led to another. Lah. Yeah, mm. one led to another. So that's what caught METI's attention. And uh, the subsequent year, they embarked into this certifying process with us. Right, I see. So the, that's how you got involved and why METI would be interested. I, I find it very interesting that even for the uh, US aid report, uh, it was very uh, geared towards like the role of remanufacturing also in international uh, trade and things. Um, and at this point, I think I want to like pick uh, Ms. Shanta's brains, uh, perhaps to like comment on uh, the developments go globally, you know, um, as various countries and even companies try to achieve sustainability. One of the uh, challenges that's faced is really how do we ensure that this is going to be a just transition um, and how do we really leave no one behind? Um, Ms. Shanta. Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have a very simple answer to that. But and, um, what it does involve is there is a multi-stakeholder and collective approach to trying to achieve the SDGs. So that's why it's great, for example, here today in this panel, we also have, you know, academia, uh, we have business, private sector, such as Randwise and us from the uh, UNGC, that we need to collectively address what is it that we can do actually leveraging on our strengths and abilities in order to deliver the SDGs. Um, so as there are 17 of them, and under each of these 17 goals, there are a multitude of specific targets what can to, what to be achieved. So for example, within the topic of today, when we're talking about responsible consumption and production, but also looking at you know, innovation and industries, all of these SDGs are interlinked in how we can actually make a change. So it's really 
taking a step backward and looking at what is it that we can do. If you are a business owner, what are some of the focus areas that you think that your business has the highest impact and where you can deliver the most value for a multitude of stakeholders? I mean, most of the businesses, they will all have a social impact, for example, looking at inclusivity and diversity within their workforce. And, um, but then in addition to that, some businesses have, for example, more impact into water and sanitation, whereas others in education. So it's really depending on from which industry and from which sector that you are from. But I think it's very clear and it's just wonderful to see initiatives such as today and seeing all of these attendees and putting questions um, that there's a sense of urgency and that everybody really understand that the moment is now that we cannot you know, keep on pushing things forward. Um, so also in the UNGC, we're really making collective effort to drive progress and impact onto identified SDG indicators. And um, so for example, if we target and um, gender equality, but also another program that we're looking at is and um, supply chain sustainability, because most of the Malaysian businesses, they're all one way or another part of a supply chain. Mm. So if we can look into how can we advance sustainability in those supply chains, that will have many direct and indirect impacts as well to the wider scope of the society. So um, once again, just to wrap up my question, there's not really a straightforward answer to that. There's a lot of work to be done, but I think that collectively we can definitely make a lot of impact. Right. Thank you very much, Mishanta, for the um, comments there as well. I think it's, it's, it's also very interesting to hear, you know, that the way forward is really together. Um, no single entity, no single country can actually achieve um, the sustainable development goals um, or even solve the climate crisis on its own. And uh, how we see ourselves as being part of this uh, very globalized value chains um, is, is an important part. Um, so it's not only the uh, business owners as well, but also all the employees um, that are part of these companies um, to actually uh, let, to play this role in advancing forward uh, a just transition and really trying to leave no one behind. So um, on that note, Mishanta, uh, I'd like to just uh, ask you, like, given all these trends that we're seeing in ESG and sustainability and, and you know, SDG starting to pick up a lot more, especially since the pandemic, um, it's just, in a way, exploded. Um, what does it actually mean for talents who are joining uh, or coming into the workforce um, at, at this point in time? Yeah, at this point in time, there's a lot of demand actually for talents who have an, a knowledge and understanding about the ESG and sustainability space. But I'd also like to take a different perspective, uh, understanding that also students are attending this, this session now. I think for these new talents, you have a very good opportunity also to drive change in the organization where you're coming from. So as I briefly mentioned in my presentation that the Gen Z and the millennials are more skewed and more inclined towards making sustainable purchasing decisions. Um, so looking into that and where all of these values and the emphasis are going to look towards moving to the future and how business is going to develop, this is the new generation that is really going to embody the change as they are the one that has to bear also a lot of the consequences of what the current institutions have been putting forward. Um, so on that note, there's a, a good demand. And I think everybody, it, regardless of what area you are focusing on, whether you are in the HR department or in finance, sustainability is a holistic approach. So having said that, according to everybody's industry, sustainability and ESG is relevant. It's just depending on which position do you have and what are your strengths and abilities to do within your organization. Um, so just to briefly mention on sustainable finance, for example, which is becoming more important. So for businesses that have also an environmental strategy, a social strategy, they are actually able to leverage on sustainable linked loans. So sustainability linked loans is just, you know, a fancy word to say that you get better discounts and better terms on your, on your loans rates, which is of course interesting to all of us, right? So if you are able in your finance department in order to make this true and to get all of the management involved looking at ESG data and how this can be used for a business advantage, there's a lot of things that can be done. So from an HR perspective, usually ESG and sustainability generally means that you are focusing, of course, on the social factors. So how could you, you know, increase the wage standards and um, how do you promote um, inclusivity and gender diversity within the board? So it's just highly dependent on where you are and, um, and what you can do. So looking at the younger generation and to the talent that is being needed, I think there's a really wonderful opportunity for, you know, especially for you um, to make these changes. 
I'm, I'm really glad you brought up that point, Nishanta, about, you know, it doesn't matter which profession you are, your sustainability is going to touch your profession and really, um, you know, being prepared, being ready to capture the opportunity is going to go and, uh, catapult you as being part of this uh, trillion dollar business. I'd like to just quickly share, uh, as what Nishanta was mentioning, uh, you know, there has been various uh, statistics and studies showing that uh, the younger workforce, especially, uh, are starting to really look for employment. Employees, uh, employers that have strong CSR po uh, policy. This was done by Cone Communications Millennial Employee Study, where 64% of millennials won't take a job if their employee uh, employer don't have a strong CSR policy, and 83% of them would be more loyal to companies um, that actually help them contribute to social environmental issues. Um, also, it was uh, there was a study uh, by WeSpire um, that found that the Gen Zs um, are basically the first generation of um, um, workforce that's actually prioritizing purpose of their work over uh, salary um, and really, you know, before even interview processes and stuff, they actually read their mission statements and values documents um, to, to choose uh, whether or not the employer matches uh, their value. So this is a really interesting thing um, that we are really seeing, especially in this time where climate change is really affecting headlines. And I guess to substantiate also what Ms. Shanta has been shared there, um, apart from the uh, debt uh, related things um, uh, in, I mean, loans related things. We're also seeing that green bonds in the uh, uh, relating to, to debt um, actually grew a lot to uh, by in last year by about 500 billion US dollars. So this is really a trillion dollar business uh, in the making. Um, and uh, it's a very exciting time for talents to get involved. But of course, now zooming back to remanufacturing, I guess I want to call on Mr. Lance to uh, um, also maybe contribute a little bit and then followed by Dr. Madeline in um, so one from the industry perspective, what are you seeing in terms of the talents needs there? Um, and then Dr. Madeline, perhaps you can comment a little bit um, from the research and development side of it. Yeah, in fact, um, just to echo um, what Ms. Shanta has mentioned and likewise what she has uh, proven by the research and statistics, um, even here in Red Hoist, uh, most of the Red Hoises here today are all driven by purpose. So of course, it's a matter of whether, um, how deep is it and how uh, you know, light instead. Because a lot of times uh, um, um, where, where, where when it deals with on the green side, you know, the green mindset has never been an easy route. Yeah, it's never been an easy journey. Yeah, so a lot of times uh, we may face setbacks as well, uh, especially in the face of um, uh, um, comparison, competitive comparisons such as refurbish, you know, hey, how, 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 did, how, how are we going to, you know, in the face of our customer, how are we going to distinguish you against them? And if they don't see that point, it sometimes gives that kind of setback to us morally. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, uh, we all have a, 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 a common ground that uh, we would like to ensure that our product would be able to help you know, reduce uh, carbon footprint and therefore slowing down climate change you know, at the best level possible. And uh, likewise for the frontliners in our company, we all would be throwing out similar messaging across instead of just talking about you know, how, how good and cheap the product is beyond mm. that. It's more so about what impacts could it deliver beyond just as a product itself. You know? So yep, that's what drives the Renvoices today. Right, thank you, Mr. Lenz. And Dr. Metlin. Well, um, from the academic perspective, with respect to talent needs that we require for remanufacturing, ideally, if one worker could be dedicated to work on one process, so in this situation, which is ideal, the learning process for that worker will be very short. And also, it would be very good if the expert person on remanufacturing could train, teach, or transfer his or her knowledge to the new worker. And of course, it is even better if the expert could document his or her experience in a standard operating procedure that could be used as 
references. So this is from the academic point of perspective, what we can do for talent, that is for remanufacturing industry. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Madeline. So um, I, I think like um, I'd like to end on the final question, actually, and then we will jump quickly into the Q&A. Um, what are the trends to be looking out for in terms of the remanufacturing scene? Uh, maybe you can start with Dr. Madeline and then back mm -hmm. to Mr. Lenz. Well, in terms of research, as I have mentioned just now, the, the recently emerging industry 4.0 and the corresponding tool has greatly impacted the manufacturing sector. So I truly believe that this trend would also be very relevant and applicable to the remanufacturing industry. And we will see in a few years to come, there will be more research on uh, things like IoT, big data analysis, augmented reality, or uh, VR that is in the field of remanufacturing because uh, remanufacturing cannot run away from these research areas as well. Someone somewhere will will do it. Yeah, right. And Miss, thank you, Dr. Madeline and Mr. Lai. I totally agree with uh, Dr. Madeline. In fact, uh, Red Twice has already embarked onto IR four point oh. So we have already been reviewed by the industry uh, forward uh, mm -hmm. committee and uh, they have gave us their new um, suggestions as well as mm -hmm. pointers. How could we tap onto uh, IR 4.0 technologies such as robotics that mm -hmm. could help accelerate our production capacity when it comes to uh, spraying? Because mm -hmm. um, in manufacturing of PCs, we perform body work as well. Yes. Yeah? Correct. And especially uh, mobile PCs are subject to drops, knocks, and therefore, you know, dents and scratches and cracks all over. So instead of just dumping the parts, we then we embark into, uh, uh, you know, body works. And uh, of course, that slows us down because um, uh, uh, that's how fast human can go, you know, you know. Um, so therefore, by adopting uh, robotic arms, that's where then it help accelerate the remanufacturing process. And uh, of course, beyond that is the IoT sensors. Um, so all in all, it's to help the uh, remanufacturing process to be accelerated and automated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond just all these technicalities uh, uh, and technologies, we are also looking into more of um, how could we kill two birds with one stone. stone. You know, um, say for instance, while we preserve uh, the environment via remanufacturing uh, in a circular economy we also would like to impact the society. So as a pledge to achieve that for RedWise, we have pledged that our third life cycle of our remanufactured equipment as when it comes back to us, we would then remanufacture and be uh, donating it to the yeah. public schools. Wow. Yeah. So therefore then it achieves such um, two uh, uh, cornerstones and uh, it's a wider impact as well because that's what Unfortunately, Malaysian public schools um, uh, in, is in a dire traits to, you know, mm -hmm. have, you know, which is to be equipped with uh, 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 decent computers yeah, to, mm -hmm. to facilitate their ICT syllabus, which mm -hmm. is, you know, which is going, you know, it's kind of worldwide thingy, right? Mm -hmm. So who else would be uh, not doing that in any countries at all? In fact, some developed countries have already um, scaled up to even uh, teaching coding in school. Mm. So can you imagine teaching coding without a PC. Mm. <laughs> so it's not really more about um, having e-syllabus or e-learning, but more so getting the technicalities in uh, the developed countries and where Malaysia seriously lag behind. So for us as a social enterprise, that's where we see a gap and we could fill it, you know, uh, which is an outcome of our remanufacturing uh, process or equipment yeah mm. Right. I, I think it's also very interesting to, to point out, you know, that uh, as these technologies come into play and as circular economy and uh, so start to play more and more, there's definitely going to be changes in terms of the uh, uh, employment patterns that we would see. I think the International Labour Organization um, even shared that uh, the transition to circular economy will create 78 million jobs, but at the same time, you're going to be expecting about 71 million jobs to um, disappear as well. So 
So really get, getting prepared and um, you know seeing how we can add value um, uh, beyond just the, uh, the the technical skills itself, uh, and really embracing beyond uh, remanufacturing. Uh, I think is is very interesting um, point in time for both talents as well as business owners. Um, and with that, Ms. Chanta, we do have a question coming up from the uh, Q and A tab. Um, the uh, Ms. Chanta, could you uh, do you mind sharing what are the calculation models for uh, UNGC uh, to assess enterprise ESG score, um, or are there any sources that we can refer to? All right. And um, so this is a good question because there are multiple ESG assessment tools available, um, which generally relates to international standards. Um, so it's depending, for example, for corporates, especially those who have an international presence, usually they will follow ESG and sustainability assessments that are provided by international um, organizations. Um, however, in order to localize it, um, that is relevant in the Malaysian context and especially for SMEs, because most of the SMEs are actually making up the economy here in Malaysia, um, UNGC in partnership with SME Corp is about to launch an ESG assessment tool for SMEs. Um, this is going to be publicly available. It will be a free digital tool. Um, it's going to be launched next month. So perhaps you would like to follow us on LinkedIn or social media so that you can be posted on this. Um, but to give a brief description what this ESG assessment tool is based on, it's about eight key ESG indicators um, that have been proven uh, significantly important into international reporting, but at the same time that is relevant and manageable for SMEs as well to comply with. Um, so having said that, climate action is a key indicator which is relevant to all businesses regarding of their size. Um, also social, such as inclusivity and diversity, which is a key feature. Uh, governance, which is including strong um, anti-corruption policies, for example. So those are some of these um, indicators, ESG indicators that are included. So what we'll do is that based on this, um, it's a more of a self-assessment tool, then companies are indicated into a maturity level. So let's mm -hmm. say if you are you know, a beginner or intermediate or advanced, actually with that kind of indicator, you can also demonstrate this to your, you know, to your suppliers or to your buyers that you're also looking into getting some incentives from this. Right. But please do, do stay put and, um, for the launch of our tool, which um, will, you know, give you more news soon. Right, that's great to hear. Thank you very much, um, Nishanta. And I see there's one more question there about ASEAN countries doing remanufacturing IT equipment. Um, I think Mr. Lance will be typing out the answer for that. Um, if there are no um, further uh, questions that, that people are submitting, unfortunately, our enjoyable time together in this celebration has come to an end. Um, so I would like to, on behalf of the host, really thank uh, all of you who have been very uh, participative in our polls and also asking your questions as well. Um, but on that note, um, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity just to share a quick uh, two two minute video about our Circular Business Association. Um, just a quick sneak peek and then we will call the uh, webinar today to a close.
So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. If you are interested to find out more about uh, Circular Business Association, please visit our website as stated here. And um, thank you very much for joining us here today. Um, these are our contact details. Um, and thank you once again to Rentwise for inviting us um, for today's session. Uh, thank you very much for all the audiences. Um, and yep, <laughs> see you all. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye.